Hello everyone, I'm Pastor Richie Clendenin. I'm the senior pastor here at Christian Fellowship Ministries. And I'd like to take a moment to personally thank you for joining us in our service time together today. Christian Fellowship has been a staple in our community and has been a wonderful gathering of, of Christ lovers from all around the region. It's a place where you can come and receive. It's a place where you can come and hear God's word as we corporately worship the name of our King together. If you're looking for a family, you, ha you don't have to look any further because we would love to have you come and join us here in service. And if you can't be here in person, then please feel free to continue to join us in our broadcast. God bless you. Sit back and let's open God's word and study his word together. There was a moment when followers of Jesus were motivated by a thought. And that thought was really simple. Jesus is coming back. The disciples genuinely believed that Jesus would return in their lifetime. I think the concept to them that we would be here in 2024 uh, would have been an extremely foreign concept. As Jesus sent them out on their short-term mission trip after the Sermon on the Mount, it's almost as if Jesus' language changed in his commissioning over them as he made his way through that passage and he starts talking about a long-term mission that he was sending them on. And he, he made a statement in there and he says, you will not have gone through all of the towns of Israel before you see the Son of Man. They understood and they believed this. Matthew chapter 24 actually tells us this, as he said on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming? Say you're coming at the end of the age. They thought it would be soon by our chronos by which we measure time. I can tell you the disciples were confused about a lot of things. They really didn't get the fact that Jesus was the suffering servant. Nor did they really understand the kingdom that Jesus talked about. But they did seem to grasp the fact that he was returning and that motivated them and it was in their minds. I fear that somewhere along the road, the church has lost sight of the fact that Jesus is coming back again. He is coming back, and he's coming back soon. It's not taught often, and when it is, it's often a tactic of fear used by ministers trying to scare people into salvation. I want to tell you something here at Christian Fellowship. We're not about scaring people into salvation. We're about inviting you into a love relationship with a Savior and the lover of your soul who gave his life for you. We're not trying to scare anybody into anything. We want to invite you into a love relationship with Jesus. Or we get in the other ditch and the return of Christ becomes so mystical and just downright weird that we miss the application of the return of Christ. Guys, uh, there's such a weird movement in the prophetic world, oftentimes, trying to do what Jesus said would be impossible, predict the date of his return. He simply said, no man knows the hour or the day. I don't know why for 2,000 years we've tried to figure out the day when Jesus says, you're not going to do it. We miss the practicality of the return of Christ. I was in a discussion on Facebook yesterday with someone. I had posted a video from Jeremiah Johnson. I don't endorse ministries from this pulpit, and this is certainly not a blanket endorsement of everything that that man has said or done. But I can tell you, he was spot on in that video. He talked about how the church has messed up the simple mission of Christ and has gone off the deep end of insanity in the prophetic movement, especially in this country, regarding, oh my gosh, the eclipse. Obviously, tomorrow's the day, guys. Aren't you thankful? Your local eclipse authority has told us tomorrow's the day. That was supposed to be funnier than it was. Eclipse, earthquakes, wars. And I've seen a lot of people trying to make sense of all this stuff. 
And it's actually going to go through seven towns named Nineveh. I'm not exactly sure what that even means. People in Jeremiah's post were using obscure Old Testament passages trying to do numerology and take the Bible out of context to predict things to us. Somebody even said that every time that a prophecy is made about Jerusalem and they capitalized USA in the middle of Jerusalem, that that meant America because we are in Jerusalem, USA. I'm like, that's never heard that interpretation before. Folks, that's weird and off-based. Jesus was born, lived a sinless life, was crucified for the sins of humanity, was raised from the dead on the third day, and he commissioned his disciples to preach the gospel because Jesus is the only way of salvation. He sent them and subsequently sent us into all the world to stay on task and to make disciples of all nations because he's coming again soon. There's the gospel for you in a nutshell. And I'm certainly not dismissing everything that's going on around us. That would be foolish. I'm actually suggesting that we, like the New Testament disciples, embrace the fact that Jesus is coming back. I suggest that we live each day with the return of Jesus in the forefront of our minds. And I have four practical points of application this morning for us regarding the return of Jesus. This is not some a feeble attempt at date setting. It's much more simplistic than that. I want us all to leave here today with these four mindsets regarding the return of the king. And if you're following along this morning on the YouVersion Bible app, uh, these four points are there before you. The first one is this. All of us should have an awareness of the return of Christ. Would you say that with me? An awareness for the return of Christ. Be aware. After all, we we live in a culture, everybody's raising awareness about something. We're at the place, we're raising awareness about raising awareness. Everybody's raising awareness. This should be in the forefront of your mind, and there's certainly going to be signs that indicate that Christ is coming back. Guys, just a cursory glance at the world around us. You can feel a palpable excitement. It's as if the words of the word are coming true. You can feel creation itself groaning for the sons of God to be revealed. How many people can feel that? You can feel with a clarity that something is going on. And there's a lot of indications that Jesus gives. He talks about, yeah, there will be signs in the heavens. But I can tell you, the signs in the heaven are not the thing that we look to for the return of Christ. Jesus actually says, those things are the beginning of sorrows, the beginning of birth pains. You remember a few years ago, it wasn't the eclipse, it was the blood moons. Blood moons, blood moon. it was indicating the return of Christ, and it certainly could be, and we shouldn't dismiss things like that. Jesus is coming back. There will be wars and rumors of wars. My own mind has been interested, and I follow on a daily basis what's taking place in Israel. Does that mean that Christ is coming back in 2024? I have no idea when Jesus is coming back, but I can promise you he is coming back. And that will certainly be a sign. Watch what's going on there. Earthquakes. I don't dismiss this stuff. Every single time I hear of an earthquake, I heard of two this week, one in Taiwan, one up in New Jersey that took place, and it was a minor earthquake. And every time I hear on the news that there's another earthquake, I think, well, that's a diverse place. The Bible says there will be earthquakes in diverse places. That should get our attention. The eclipse. My goodness. There have been many of these things. Will there be signs in the sky? Yes. Could that be one of them? I'm not God. I don't know. If you go watch the eclipse, put glasses on. That's all I want to say. That stuff is the beginning of birth pains. And as you see them, if we would just actually listen to what Jesus says, he says the end is not yet. Those are Jesus' words. Well, when will the end be? I'm glad you asked. 
The clearest metric that we have to see his return is the fulfillment of the Great Commission. There is an extensive list. You heard Renee during announcements this morning on the wall of the conference room in WME over there. It's an extensive list of every UPG, every unreached people group. And as that list diminishes, I want to tell you something. His return is getting closer. Jesus said, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in every ta ethne, in every ethnic linguistic tribal group around the planet. Why is that? Because there will be people from every tribe and every nation and every tongue around the throne of God bringing glory and honor to the name of Jesus. There will not be one language missing at that place. Aren't you thankful for that? Don't you want to be a part of that eternal chorus bringing praise and honor to the name of Jesus? Somebody will be represented from each one of those. That's why that's there. That's why we do what we do. That's why we pour money into church planning movements. It's why we send our best resources out of this church to the nation. It's why we do DTC. It's why we have a Christian school to equip a generation to impact the world. I want to see the job complete. I want to be part of that final day's push to push the gospel into the furthest most parts of the world. What an honor that is, guys. I'm telling you, Brother Parrish and David, over the years, set that as a foundation of this church. And if you've been in this church for any amount of time, it is an honor to be part of a small place right here in the middle of nowhere, USA, Brinesburg, Kentucky, that has had tentacles that has touched every part of this planet. Thank you, Jesus, for being part of a church that wants to see the world know our King. You must be aware of the return of Christ. I'll tell you what else we must be. Number two, we must be prepared for the return of Christ. A bride doesn't just need to be aware that it's her wedding day. A bride... (laughs) <laughs> prepares for that wedding day. We're, we're doing a lot of pre-marriage counseling right now. We're doing four different couples that are getting married. We love pre-marriage counseling. And, and I ask each one of them when I meet, when we meet with them, how's the planning going? Guys, we, it, it's, it's just mass chaos. You don't just show up and get married. You've got you to gotta schedule the caterer. You've you got to buy the dress. And, and they even have shows. Is this the dress? Whatever that's called. And a lot of you watch that. That's great. There's you got to get the, the wedding planner. you got to get the venue. you got to get the reception venue. The men have to get their tuxes. They're always about a month behind what the wife wants them to be in getting the tuxes. They've got to do that. Who's going to do your hair? Who's going to do your makeup? Who's going to do? You don't just show up and get married. Us men, we wish that you did. I remember those planning days. Jenny was like, what do you think about napkins? I'm like, I I don't care. What color should the invitations be? I I don't know. What what do we need to do about this? Whatever we got to do. Jenny, I I trust you fully. You've always been so great at making decisions. You you just make those. I, I validate you're making the right decision. What's your point? It takes preparation, not just awareness. Like the Bible says, we're to keep our lamps burning and our oil stocked up. How do we prepare for the return of Christ? Well, the first thing it has to be is we have to get our own hearts right. There's a lot of stuff to get entangled with in this world. I don't know if you realize that or not. There's a lot of things that, like like the book of Hebrews says, there's a lot of weights and sins that easily beset us. What do we do? We cast those things off and we focus on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. And I'm telling you, if you hear nothing else today, this is not the day and age that it's a good time to be playing around with sin. Repent. Get that stuff out of your life and start living and pursuing Jesus on a daily basis. 
The next thing that we can do to prepare is this. We must look out for spirits that Jesus said would be present in the last days that could trip us up. You better be aware of the pitfalls that's going to be present in the last days. I wrote down a few of these. The first one is this, a spirit of deception. There's going to be a lot of that. There is a lot of that. Jesus says there'll be false prophets. And he says, don't go out chasing them. This is not Richie's words. These are the words of Christ. That's not to negate prophecy. I believe in prophecy. But I want to tell you what biblical prophecy is in the New Testament. The spirit of prophecy, according to the book of Revelation, is the testimony of Jesus. Not one amen. I want to say that again. The spirit of prophecy is to point to Jesus Christ. The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Christ. That's the whole purpose of the Holy Spirit. He came to point people to Jesus, to convict people and point them and draw them to Jesus. Anything that's not lifting up the name of Jesus, I want no part of. Use that as a litmus test in today's culture. If you listen to a podcast and the name of Jesus is not mentioned, throw that in the trash can. Richie, that's bold. If I'm wrong, I'm going down with that shit. It's about Jesus. Paul also said that people will not be holding fast to sound doctrine, looking to and fro for something that suits their own passions. Holy cow, do we live in that age, Rick Driscoll. You want a church, you can find somebody to say the things that you're wanting to hear. Guys, be very careful of that. Don't chase itching ears. I have things that I want to hear too. I'll tell you what I look for in a a message. I look for somebody that's going to preach the Word of God because this is life. It doesn't return void. This has power. This is the living, breathing, absolute truth of God's Word. I don't want to hear anything else. That's just me. Be leery of any nonsense or teachings that don't confirm the word of God or don't lift up the person of Jesus, no matter how spiritual it may sound. We don't need new teachings. We don't need a podcast of garbage. We need a prophet, a movement of true prophets to arise who seek the honor and the glory of the name of Jesus Christ. That's what we need. People that are hungry for his honor and his fame. In other words, stop eating trash. Uh, I was thinking about the Seinfeld episode. I don't know why I'm saying this on a Sunday morning uh, back in the 90s. This popped in my head. When George ate the eclair out of the trash can, had one bite out of it, and he tried to make excuses as to why it was okay Everybody's offended, and and I hope you're not offended at this illustration. It popped in my head, okay? It's 30 years ago. Forgive me if you would. There's an eclair sitting on top of the receptacle with one bite out of it still sitting in the doily on top of a magazine, and George sees it, and he reaches down, and he takes a bite out of it, and and he gets busted. And he tries to convince Jerry why it was okay that he ate trash. And Jerry's like, but it was in the can. He said, no, it was on top. He said it was hovering over the trash can at, like an angel. That, that's what it was doing. And Jerry says, George, adjacent to refuse is refuse. Was it eaten? He said, just one bite. Not, not a big deal. There was only one bite. I ate out of the other end. The doily was still on it. This is what I see in a lot of modern nonsense in the body of Christ. It is trash sitting next to trash, and we try to make excuses as to why it's okay that I eat this. Hear the word of the Lord this morning. You better have a spirit of discernment in today's culture. And if something's trash, be wise enough to call it as trash and leave it in the trash can. 
Because if not, you start eating that, it starts affecting you and leading you down a different path. Is that right? The next thing that I see is a spirit of division. Jesus says that father will betray son. Mother-in-law will betray daughter-in-law. Betrayal will abound. What does that mean for us? As the body of Christ, you must strive for a spirit of unity with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Can I confess and repent before my family this morning? I've not always done the best job of that. I've oftentimes been the propagator of division, especially through Facebook. It's easier to do that. Mm, a little shot, a little zinger, zing. Not in today's culture. We must strive for unity. What does that mean? The essential things that bind us together in Christ. I, I don't want to have an argument and dissension about something that's minor. I want to come together around Jesus. I'll tell you why. In the last days, we are going to be an army that are fighting this thing together. It's not me taking on the world. We need each other, guys. We need the body of Christ. Nobody fights by themselves. We are an army of people. We're a family. That, maybe that's a better word that God has put together. What does that mean? Strive, fight for unity because in the last days, as you see things out there happening, you should know there's going to be betrayal. People are going to be divided. It's not going to be good. I must fight for unity. Another spirit that Jesus says will be present in the last day is a spirit of lukewarmness. We hear about that in the book of Revelation that John writes in the church. Like, don't, he would rather you be hot or cold. What, well, how did Jesus say that? He said that in those days, the love of many people will grow cold because lawlessness will abound. Sin is rampant in our world, and it's going to get worse. As in the days of Noah, the Word teaches us. Guys, we should watch and pray and keep a guard on ourselves, making sure that we're not falling into things ourselves. And perhaps we need to ask ourselves this question, am I as passionate about the cause of Christ as I was yesterday or last week or last year? If I start taking my eyes off of Jesus and start taking my eyes and putting them on all of the junk happening in the world today, I'll tell you what follows me. Discouragement and sometimes fear. And and a great deal of anger too. If I get my eyes off of Jesus and I start, well, this is going on here, this is going on here, and I fail to realize he's put the answer to those things on the inside of the body of Christ if we would be obedient to do what he told us to do. What are we focused on? How is your passion level this morning? Is your own personal love growing cold because things aren't like they used to be? Man, that's a sermon right there. I've been there. I don't like things not being like they used to be. But I don't want it to affect my passion level for Christ. I'll tell you another thing that's going to be in the world today, uh, in the end days, and this is one that I'm not necessarily looking forward to in my flesh. It's a spirit of persecution. (sighs) Jesus never said that Christianity would be popular. Did you realize that? First of all, let me start off by saying we've had a redemptive lift in this nation the last 250 years. Thank you, Jesus, for that. That's abnormal because it's not the way Jesus said it would be, which makes me believe that time is coming. He said you will be hated by How many nations? All nations for my name's sake. I want to tell you in the midst of that, not a hair of your head will perish. Jesus is going to take care of us. Well, it might cost you your life. But persecution is coming. There's no sense in fighting it. As the end days come, persecution will abound more and more and more. 
That's the way Jesus said it would be. What do you do? Well, you go to this city, and then you go to that city, you go to that city. It's okay, because greater is he that's in us, and Jesus is worth paying whatever price we have to pay. Everyone say, I must be aware of his coming. Now say this, I must be prepared for his coming. The third point I see is this. There is an urgency to the return of Christ. You know, if a lot of the stuff you're seeing on Facebook is true, if let's just take a hypothesis this morning. If the eclipse, let me use that, okay? Going through seven towns of Nineveh is representative of the end times. And Jesus is coming back because of that. The question is, how many people have you told about Christ this week since you've seen that? If our response is anything other than getting the word out, Jesus is coming. Let me tell you what you are. You are cruel. If we know Christ is coming, but we hoard that information to ourselves while we relegate the rest of the world to a Christless eternity in hell, you have missed the heart of Jesus. Get out in the streets. Go to the highways. Go to the byways. Let them know the king is coming. There's little time left. Get things right. Get your house in order. Those things are not working side by side together. We focus on the return of Christ, but I don't see this push towards world evangelization. The urgency of Christ demands obedience in our lives. It's like after the ascension, Jesus goes up into the sky, and they're just like... You see him anymore? Like a lot of people will be tomorrow. Wear your glasses. Looking up in the sky. He has to send an angel to say, why do you stand here looking around? Just like he ascended, he shall return. If you believe Jesus is coming back soon and you know the state of the world that we sit in, it is the utmost form of cruelty to not run and tell people that Jesus is coming back. If current events, earthquakes, signs in the skies, wars have made you feel that Christ's return is imminent and our response is something other than preaching the gospel, we've missed the point. The urgency of the return of Christ is we must take his words seriously to go and make disciples of all nations. What does that mean for us? It's time to get to work. Get to work. How many people believe Jesus is coming back? About 10% of our church. That might be the problem. I'm just joking, kind of. Jesus ends that whole discourse in Matthew chapter 24 by saying this, Who is the faithful and wise servant whom his master has set over his household to give them their food at their proper time? He says, Blessed is the servant when his master returns. We'll find him doing just that. Are you being faithful with what Christ has called us to do. I'm talking about practical applications of the return of Christ. We must be aware of it. We must be prepared for it. And there's a sense of urgency to the return of Christ. This one, the last point, by the way, this morning, has changed a lot over my life. I'm calling it the excitement of the return of Christ. This is silly, but I dare say I'm not the only one. When I was a young man, I was terrified of the return of Jesus. Mostly because I didn't have an assurance of salvation and because I'd never really heard the gospel. I was left wondering this question, have I done enough? Is there unconfessed sin in my life? I used to pray as a young man, dear Jesus, don't come back tonight. That's so silly. Or I started praying this the older I got. 
I want to live my life. I want to get married. I want to I used to pray, Jesus, don't come back until I have a family of my own. My prayer wasn't for the salvation of people that didn't know him. I wanted a family. I wanted children. I wanted a wife. And I thank God for the one he gave me. Amen. I want to read Luke's account of the same conversation out of Luke chapter 21. He says, there will be signs... In the sun and moon and stars and on the earth, distress of nations and perplexity. Because of the roaring of the sea and the waves, people fainting with fear and with foreboding of what's coming on the world. For the powers of the heaven will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Jesus says this in verse 28, When these things begin to take place, straighten up, raise your heads because your redemption is drawing nigh. This is not a day for fear. This is a time to start feeling the palpable excitement of the return of Jesus Christ. Start lifting up your heads because you know as you see things, biblical prophecy coming to pass in this book, on the news, right in front of you every day. It's not a day to say, oh, Lord, wait, not yet. It's a time to start lifting your head and realize the redemption that Jesus Christ paid for in your life is about to take place. There's an excitement to the return of of Christ. Fear is not the response. Paul actually said it this way when he was referencing death. He says, I'm hard pressed. I'm torn between two decisions. I, I, I want to be here in the flesh because it's better for you if I do that. But there's something in me that's craving and, and yearning for something so much more. And he puts it this way, to be absent from this body is to be present with the Father. Maybe it's, man, I hate to use this phrase. It hurts my feelings, middle age. But I've had a perspective change. I'm ready. I, I mentioned we read three cards of three dear members of this church that passed away this last week. There have been a lot of that happening. I, on, on the road to the last cemetery, I, I told my wife, I don't want to do one more funeral. I just want us all to go be together with the Lord. I'm ready. The older I get, the things of this world are starting to grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and face. I don't have to do one more thing. I don't want another accolade. I don't want another trophy. The only thing I want is as many people as is possible to know Jesus. I'm ready. I'm excited. I feel the expectancy. I want Jesus to come back soon. And I would be most happy if he interrupted this sermon to do so. If, if we just heard trumpets right now, oh, praise the Lord. Let, let's end this service, guys. Let, let, let's have a better service somewhere else. I'm ready. <laughs> I'm ready for the return of Jesus. I'm ready for the king to break through that eastern sky and to come and get his church. I am part of that creation that is now yearning. I feel this yearning expectantly for the return of Jesus, our maker, our savior, the one who died for us, who is redeeming us, that we can be sons of God and no longer servants living in fear. He's going to come and he's going to gather the sons and daughters and he's going to bring them into the glory with him. I read this morning in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul tells us to comfort one another with these words. That's our comfort. It's our hope. And I feel an excitement about it. Whew. I've become envious of those who have beat me there. 
I'm jealous of the 140 that I've done funerals for in the last 14 years. I'm jealous. I don't, I don't mourn, I'm envious. Their service this morning is so much better than what we experienced. Oh, they've joined in, joined in the angelic song of holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Worthy are you. Worthy are you. Every time I hear that song from so long ago, I can only imagine. I'm telling you even now, I don't care. I've heard it a thousand times. It brings me to tears because it brings me to the reality of that will be my experience one day. I'll be in his presence. I'll be able with my own voice to extol the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Praise the name of Jesus. Can you feel the excitement this morning? Are you ready for the return of the King? Whew. I can't tell you when Jesus is coming back. I'm not trying to scare you. That, that's not my tactic. I don't even want to try to guess when he's coming back. I just want to be found faithful when he does. I want to wake up every morning and be about the Father's business, and I want to live each day like today is that day. Get up every morning and say, Jesus is today the day. I give you my best today. All of the arguments about eschatology, how's it going to look, I, I don't really care about that. I just want him to come now. I want to give him my best each day. I, I want to serve the king and the kingdom each and every single day. Four simple points of application as you see things in the world. And I, I would be remiss if I didn't speak on this this morning. Last week we celebrated the resurrection. There's a lot of things that's transpired in the world. And it's got a lot of people asking questions. These four points. Be aware that the king is coming. Be prepared for the king to come. Embrace the urgency that that message demands and live in a palpable excitement of the fact that he's coming. Those four things, they're simple, they're elementary, but if we grasp them, they will change our lives. I want us to pray. Heavenly Father, as we come before you today, I thank you first and foremost for your plan of redemption for us as sinful humanity. Jesus, we did not deserve what you did for us. You came and lived that sinless life, yet you were arrested and beaten and brutally tortured and subsequently executed on the cross of Calvary for our sins. And when you did, the temple veil was torn in two from top to bottom, and you rose again gloriously on the third day, revealing yourself to mankind for weeks. And then you ascended into heaven, but before you did, you gave us a mission to preach the gospel to all ethne to every tribal group, to every linguistic group around the planet, and to make disciples of them. Don't just preach. Make disciples of them, teaching them to observe all that you commanded. Or that's the age we're in right now. But I fear we've embraced the mysticism of the return of Christ without heeding the urgency that that call demands. Lord, if we believe that, which I do with everything inside of me, I feel like we need to begin this morning with a collective repentance. Lord, we've not answered that urgency. I can't speak for other people. I've not answered that urgency. Jesus, the King is coming. 
the king is coming. Praise God, he's coming for me. Jesus, make us prepared. Give us the wisdom, Lord, to watch out for the things that you said to watch out for. God, help us to get the garbage out of our life. Help us, Lord, to have the wisdom to repent and to quit toying around with the things of this world. Let us embrace the urgency and the call to obedience. May we be the faithful servants found so doing when you come. And Lord, I pray that fear would be vanquished. There's nothing to fear. If we're in Christ, that's an excitement. That's something to embrace, to look forward to. There's no dread or fear. Hold on just a second, Seth. Before we get to that, I, I want you guys to sing this with me. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see when I look upon his face the one who saved me by his grace when he takes me by the hand and leads me to the promised land. What a day, glorious day that will be. Sing it again. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. When I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace, when he takes me by the hand, he leads me through the promised land. What a day! Glorious day that will be. There'll be no sorrow there. No more burdens to bear. No more sickness, no pain. No more parting over there. And forever I will be with the one who died for me. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day that will be. When my Jesus I shall see, when I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace, when he takes me by the hand and leads me to the promised land what a day glorious day ah, come on just one more time let's all stand to our feet and lift our hands what a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see when I look upon his face, 
The one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand, he leads me through the promised land. What a day. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Let's all bow our heads. That's the invitation this morning. Ready yourself. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other way to the Father except through Him, and He provided the way of access for dying for your sins Prepare yourself as the bride of Christ for the return of the bridegroom. If there's something in your life this morning, if you were like me, and that's more of a fearful thing because you know you're not where you need to be. You've been toying around with things you shouldn't be toying around with. You've allowed things in your life. And honestly, if he was to come back today, you don't have a clue where you would be. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to ask that question this morning. If that's you, if you say, Richie, that's me. I need to get things right with Jesus. I'm not ready. If that's you, would you just lift your hand? I'm not going to have you come up front. Everybody's eyes are closed. I don't want to make a spectacle. That's not what this is about. It's between you and the Lord. Say, Richie, that's me. Would you just lift your hand up high? I, I need to get things right with Jesus. I need to get things right with Jesus. I need to get things right. I'm not where I need to be. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's all say this prayer together. Dear Jesus, I count the cost. And I claim you as my Savior. And I vow to follow you as my Lord. Forgive me. I don't hide the sins in my life. I confess them. And I lay them at your feet. And I repent of them. Cleanse me from my unrighteousness. And deliver me from my sin. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Guys, I love each and every one of you. I'm going to be at this altar. They're going to continue to worship. If anybody needs further prayer, I'm here to pray with you for anything. I love you guys. We'll see you next week right here at 10 a.m. God bless you guys. There's a lot of decisions that you'll make in life, but none of them will ever compare to the one decision that matters, and that's what will you do with Jesus. We encourage you to sit down, to calculate the cost, and to make the greatest decision that you could ever make and declare Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you need some counsel or if you need someone to pray with you or if you need more information about what it looks like to be a Christ follower, feel free to call us here at the church at Christian Fellowship at the number at the bottom of your screen. We're here to serve you as we do this thing called life together.